biggest challenges facing us. Population has increased incredibly. In 1900, the population of the world was 1.5 billion. On the 31st of October, 2011, that had increased to 7 billion. By 2050, we expect it to be over 9 billion. And alarmingly, by the turn of the century, 2100, it'll be well over 10 billion. Now, the challenge is how to, fo how to provide food, feed, and fiber for a population that will be twice the population that we have today. We have to double food, feed, and fiber production. And not only do we have to double production, but we have to do it sustainably. Less land, less water, less fertilizer, less pesticides. It is evident that conventional technology alone will not allow you to double food, feed, and fiber production. But neither is biotechnology a panacea. It is not a silver bullet that will solve all your problems. It is a technology, an essential and powerful technology that needs to be managed properly. So when we look at the potential to feed the world of tomorrow, we believe that you need to use the best of conventional technology with the best of biotechnology and bring them together. It is the synergism of using them together that offers the best possibility of feeding the world of tomorrow with over 10 billion people. March 25, 2014 uh, was a very special day because Norman Borlaug, the Nobel Peace Laureate from 1970, who saved almost a billion people from hunger, um, was... Oh, can you cut it there? Okay. Yeah. Let me go back over that. Okay, continue. March 25, 2014 was a very special day. Norman Borlaug, the Nobel Peace Laureate for 1970, would have been 100 years old. He saved approximately a billion people from hunger in the Green Revolution of the 1960s. He was a creative, innovative individual who actually increased food production in a very significant way. When working in Mexico in the early 40s, over a 15-year period, he was able to increase wheat yield by a factor of five. This transformed Mexico from an importing country for wheat into an exporting one. Later, the same wheat germplasm was taken to Asia, to countries like India and Pakistan. And in that region, they increased uh, wheat uh, production by about 300%. This meant that the doomsday people who said that Asia was finished were wrong. Technology, food technology in this case, was able to overcome a major constraint on a global basis. The same is true today as we look at biotechnology, a very important technology that can help boost yields over a period of time. We believe that uh, biotechnology, whereas it's not a panacea, has a very important role to play. Interestingly, developing countries are now planting more biotech crops than industrial countries. In 2013, the acreage of um, biotech crops in developing countries were greater than those in industrial countries. Developing countries planted 54% of the global hectare of 175 million hectares compared with only 46% in developing countries. There are some important lessons being learnt. One is the importance of public-private partnerships. To date, most of the biotech crops have been developed by the private sector. And in this year, 2014, we see countries like Bangladesh commercializing a technology that was donated by the private sector. More specifically, the company from India, Mahiko 
donated a gene that conferred insect resistance in uh, eggplant. This is called brinjal in India. This crop normally requires something like 80 sprays of insecticide, which is a great number. And with the use of the new technology, we have been able to cut that down by 70 to 90%. The other important element in place in Bangladesh is political will. The Minister of Agriculture, Matia Chowdhury, provides the political support and the political will so that, in fact, th these products can be made available to farmers uh, in the country uh, at the earliest possible time. I believe that countries in Africa can learn from this. We are just here in Egypt uh, with um, 90 million people uh, at the moment, expected to increase to twice that level by 2050. Egypt has a very special challenge because 97% of the country is non-arable, only 3% is arable. So the challenge is how do you increase production significantly on the 3% of land that you have in Egypt and that really needs political will. What are the opportunities here? I think there are two crops that um, uh, can be looked at carefully. One is maize. Uh, BT maize was grown in Egypt from 2008 until 2012 and then was discontinued pending a government review. That increase in production that you get from a BT maize is important for Egypt at this time. If we look at the opportunities beyond maize, Egypt is a very important producer of cotton. Cotton uh, consumes more pesticides than most crops. So the opportunity here for uh, Egypt is to use the BT cotton. It's a very special variety called Barbadense, the long staple cotton. And in one stroke of the pen, you can increase production significantly uh, and at the same time cut down on pesticide application. This means that you've got a technology that is good for the environment, good for small farmers who are actually putting these sprays on with very little protection. To move that then, um, I think political will is very important and I'm sure that if uh, Egypt takes a look at the experiences of other developing countries using this technology, it will be, ex it'll be able to expedite the approval and the commercialization of these crops. Do you want anything else? No, thank you. Still yeah?